Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ben. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, how to be remembered, that is one thing. It does help if you've got two of the biggest eyebrows uh, in the O2, uh, and you won't be forgotten uh, that way, and that's a good tip if anyone would like to paint any on. Uh, are you having a good campus party so far? Yeah, pretty good. Excellent. Looks fantastic. There's so much going on. Can you just raise your hand if you are from uh, Great Britain? Just so I've got a rough show. Oh, quite a lot. Okay. And, keep, uh, uh, and your hand up if you're not from Great Britain. So who have we got? Just give me, where are you from, sir? India. India. Welcome from India. Yeah. The Netherlands. Very good. The Czech Republic. I was uh, there just the other day. Fantastic. Yes, sir. In Germany. Anyone else? Yep. From Spain. Very good. Buenos dias. Yes. Nigeria. Anyone? Yes? Brazil? And anyone else? Brazil as well. Very good. We speak Portuguese in Brazil, right? So I want to say bom dia. Is that right? Just about? Okay, I'm going there soon. All right. Well, could we just say, because Brits, we do have a reputation sometimes as being a little cold, don't we? So could we just give a round of applause to welcome all of our international guests? And we'll go, welcome, guys. Uh, it's good to have you here. Uh, so speaking of which, uh, if nothing else in this session, uh, I hope you might get a couple of thoughts and tips and ideas, but also I hope you get to meet each other. So let's get in the spirit a little bit. It's not all going to be like this, but a little bit by all just standing up. Everyone just stand up a little bit before I formally kick off proceedings. And I'd like you to uh, turn to someone you're fairly sure, unless it was very late last night, you have never met before. If you have met them, you've forgotten. And just shake them warmly by the hand. And you'll say, oh, good. Oh, you can do that up here. You can do that up here. Here we go, having lunch. All right, here we go, and uh, just shake them warmly by the hand, okay. Thank you very much, and, uh, and back with me. And now turn to someone else and shake them warmly by the hand as well. Oh, oh. Very good. Hello, really. All right, guys, okay, thank, thanks very much. Uh, have a seat, have a seat. Okay. Okay, well, before I, um, thank you very much. Oh, we've got, oh, we're on to it here in Brazil. Oh, Brazil meets Nigeria. Right, here we go. Crikey, we're off. Uh, so before we get properly started, I just uh, thought I'd just see what we're like as a group of meters and greeters. Uh, I often like to ask the question, how was that handshake for you? Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, if you were to rate a handshake on a scale of one to five, where one is uh, really quite bad, and five is pretty amazing, like shaking, ha uh, shaking hands with Barack Obama himself. Who's just been on the receiving end of a five? Hands up, yes. Ha hands up of a five, okay, very good. Now, uh, is it Richard? What? Mike, would you like to stand up, Mike? And just tell us, well, we don't need a mic for now, just point to the person who shook your hand. Oh, oh, well, how many? Quite a few of them. I want to make friends here. Oh, so you've really gone off like a rocket, so Mike. all the handshakes are fine. Right, good. They're all fine. <laughs> Is that the flattery will get you everywhere school I hope of so. thought? Okay, and if you had to single out, and we'll get. Ben, have we got a roving mic here somewhere? Wait, before we go, there's a little warm up here. Thank you very much. Full marks. Uh, if you had to point to someone who gave you a five out of five, who would that be? The gentleman from right. Lagos. Can we have a round of applause for Lagos, please? Here we go. Very good. So what's your name? Yeah, Yusuf. In Joseph? Yusuf. 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 And just tell us, Joseph, what goes into a five out of five handshake, just so we know, just so we're getting used to it? Well, um, what it was firm. Firm? Um, yeah, for his age. Oh, it's, oh for, firm for his age? Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, he's going down to a four. No, 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 firm. We'll stop on firm. Got anything else? Yeah, um, we we'll spoke a bit. Nigeria. <laughs> no, well, anyway, on and moving on. Yeah. Well, He's been to my country before. Yes, good. Okay, so uh, instant connection. Yeah, this connection there. Um, yeah. He's been to Asaba, yes. which is the capital of Delta State. Very good. Um, so, and would you give him a five as well? Yeah, I will give him oh, a five. Oh, it's five and five. Excellent. Ten out of ten. Very good. Now, quick question. I don't want to start on a sour note, ladies and gents, but was anyone, if they think about it now, on the receiving end of a one? I know campus party is quite friendly, but was any, did anyone get, now they've really thought about it, a bit of a... A bit of a one. What about, yeah, the old dead fish. Did anyone get what they call a two? Come on. Did anyone think could do better? Two. You're very polite, campus party. What about a three? Don't tell me everyone got four and five. I don't. But yeah, yeah, a three. Right, all stand up. Ooh, right, this could be controversial. Now, sir, you received a three, would you say? You wouldn't like to downgrade that to a two? 
No, no, I'll go with three. No, you'll go with the three it's for now. Party, uh, well, exactly right, exactly right. It's slightly off guard. Okay, who gave you that three? The man over there. Stand up, sir. Give him a round of applause. What's your name? Harvey. Harvey, Harvey. Uh, well, before, before you get a chance to argue your corner, Harvey, <laughs> talk us through Harvey's, um, you know, what, what it was like for you, really. I mean, it's terrible, Yeah, really. it was a tiny bit hesitant, a tiny bit limp, and not much full-on conversation. Well, Harvey, oh, stand, stand in standard distance. He could have a right hook on him here. <laughs> now, Harvey, ex explain yourself. I mean, you know, what, 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 what caused you to give this three? Uh, I guess the hesitation was I, we weren't no eye contact to begin with, so I wasn't too sure if we were going for it or... Ah, 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 didn't know whether we were going... <laughs> okay, so exactly, half and half. Uh, so yeah. um, sorry about the limp handshake. Uh, but, but given a second chance, you reckon you uh, could... Definitely. You right, okay. Well, it's all part of the warm-up, really. However, what I like... Sit down, sit down. You could be good friends. Let's have another go. Oh, yeah. There you go. Right, okay. Now, one more time before we get started. Right, everybody, stand up one more time for me. And somebody else, the third person lucky, okay? You can play along, by the way, uh, up in the dress circle. Now you finish your lunch and your, and your sandwiches and your drinks. Uh, and, uh, and shake a, a third person, someone you've never met before, and give them a five. <laughs> right. Okay, very good, thank you. Thank you, okay, and have a seat. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, all have a seat, thank you. They are getting into it, all right. Okay, and off the back of that, um, who now realizes that that really is what a five is supposed to feel like? Hands up. Very, very good, very, very good. Uh, can you give yourself a round of applause, because I think that's been a good development. Okay, now. <clears throat> it's not really about uh, handshakes uh, today, but uh, I have got uh, just a couple of uh, uh, things I wanted to share with you by way of introduction, because I have got some tips and I have got some thoughts, but I don't think they make total sense if I don't spend just a few minutes uh, just going through uh, a little bit about the hats that I have worn. And I have worn multiple hats over the last few years. Uh, I love starting things and I love bringing people together to make stuff happen. That's my passion in life. So a few years ago, I thought it would be fun to get a group of high-growth tech companies, put them on a plane, and take them to San Francisco for a week of fun and activity. And this is a very amateur photo. It's actually taken by Mike Butcher of TechCrunch, and most of the people in here didn't probably think it was going to be shown at the O2. Uh, but uh, this was in 2000, I think, in seven or 2008, and it was the first ever web mission I organized to San Francisco. And off the back of that mission, friendships were made, money was raised, literally in the millions, and some really important partnerships were formed. So here we have David Langer, who is now actually based out of San Francisco. We have Edie Lush, then at The Spectator. I can see Andrew Scott, who founded a company called Rumble and is now doing some amazing things in mentoring. And way back at the bus, I can even see a guy called Andy McLaughlin, who founded a company called Huddle. And those people all met through Webmission. Actually, in row D, I can see Alithia Navarro, who founded a fantastic company called Skimlinks. And it was through Webmission that she met some of her now best friends. So I love bringing people together. I started and helped start a campaign called Startup Britain, which is helping companies who've decided they want to start up to get going on the road. Startupbritain.co, it was launched by the Prime Minister and it's completely funded by businesses. So uh, it's been going two and a half years and we've opened nine shops. Our latest shop is on Piccadilly. I started something called Tenor, a ridiculously simple idea where we give school kids 10 pounds and they have a month to turn it into something. If you Google Tenor, you can see some of the things they've come up with. And here we see one teenager turned a Tenor into 700 pounds in a month. So we've handed out over 60,000 10 pound notes. So I love starting businesses and I love starting charitable things as well. So this is Tenor and it's run by a brilliant organization called Young Enterprise. In my business life, I love bringing very different organizations together. So this is a very simple scheme. It's called VIY, like volunteer it yourself. And it's one of the biggest home improvement chains in the UK, helping young people fix their own youth clubs and community buildings. So we're doing over 40 clubs in the next few months all over Great Britain. And that's the point of the scheme. So people that would never otherwise have met coming together 
to make something happen which is good for business and good for their area. So that is what gets me up in the morning. I have slightly cheated, and this is the end of my formal introduction, because not in 2008, but a few years before that, I started hosting events in London. And the theme was uh, speed networking. So literally, two minute conversations with somebody you've never met before to see what they're like, and then move on around the room. And I ended up doing it in, I think, about 12 countries in a month in 2008. And that has fueled my desire to meet people, but also my contact book. So I now literally have, uh, I'm privileged to know thousands of people, but across really different areas all over the world. And that's been fueled by hosting good stuff and bringing them together. So this is me, and this is what gets me up in the morning. So what I thought I'd do is just ask for a bit of a show of hands, if that makes sense. Uh, who has actually started a business before in their life? Hands up. OK. And who is right now running a startup business? Fantastic. And who is on the cusp of or thinking about starting a business? Excellent. Fantastic. OK, that really helps. Well, um, now, what I'm about to say is not, oh, and by the way, hands up if you are currently under the age of 40 years old, under the age of 40. OK, so quite a, a bit of a young crowd. OK, OK. So the comment I'm going to make now is not uh, an ageist comment. However, it's a couple of reasons why I think Campus Party is so brilliant and why I think that, in some cases, younger years are so powerful. And I say this because I started my first company at university in the north of England at Leeds University. Okay? The first thing is um, you will find, and if you haven't found this already, I promise you you will, people want to help you. Okay? There is such an amazing resource in the people at this event and at so many other events to help you, to spend time with you, to mentor you, to advise you. And sometimes you can play off the fact that you're just starting out, whatever age you are. So that's really, really powerful. Secondly, and there will come a time in everyone's life when they have a lot to lose, whether that's finances, whether that's relationships and mortgages and all of the grown-up stuff. Very often, when you're starting out at a particularly younger age, you haven't got as much to lose. And so I think it's a really exciting time to start something. Thirdly, you've got a fresh perspective on the world. Okay? And this is probably the most important point of all. Okay? Has anyone ever worked in a bar or a pub? Hands up. Okay. So I worked in a pub 15 years ago. And on my first day at the pub, see if you can relate to this, I noticed about 20 things wrong in the pub. So the window was a bit broken, or a lot broken. Uh, the carpet was frayed. My boss had a funny thing on the end of his nose. You know, a lot was wrong, OK? And on the second day, I noticed 19 things wrong with the pub. And on the third day, 18 things were wrong. And after 20 days, I could see nothing wrong with the pub. Would anyone like to give me a generous guess as to why I saw nothing wrong with the pub? Because I'd fixed everything that was wrong. <laughs> I wish I had. Second guess. Yes, I got used to it. Because there was loads that was rubbish. And there was loads that was broken. And I just got used to it. And so whatever industry you're interested in. We need to ask you to get on the stage so you can be on the camera. Oh, I can get on the stage. Oh, no, I was hoping to avoid Tinterweb. OK, I'm on. Right. OK, well, that's my confession, ladies and gents. I couldn't see anything wrong after 20 days because I just got used to it all, OK? And that is one of the challenges. And so whatever industry you're going into, there is an amazingly powerful thing about having that fresh perspective to say, you know what, this sucks. You know what, why do we do it like that? Could we not do it like this? And so I absolutely salute any single one of you who's starting out on a journey, whether you're in day one of it or year one of it, uh, to start your own things. And that's why I think uh, Campus Party is absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is just share with you a few practical tips and, uh, and hints, if you like, uh, about, uh, 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 about this sort of art of networking. Now, before I start, I've got a confession. I often get introduced at events, and Ben, thank you for your generous words. Uh, I often get introduced as, you must meet Ollie, he's a networker. Hands up if you think that's a really lovely word. Oh, not a lot of hands. Okay. All my brain hears when I get introduced as a networker is, you must meet Ollie, he's a prat. 
Yeah? And then they see the look of horror on my face, and then they say, no, 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 you have to understand, he's a really big networker. My heart sinks, and they say, you know what, this guy, I tell you, he's been described as the biggest networker in Britain, and I find it really quite depressing, okay? However, from time to time, I'll meet someone, and I'll say, you must meet my friend, Annie Parker, she's very well connected. Hands up if I said that about you, you'd feel that was a compliment. Hey. And you are, and everybody wants to be thought of as well connected. And so why? And here's the point. If you are well connected, you can attract opportunities. And every single day of the year, great opportunities from around the world will drop into your inbox. And there is nothing more exciting. The other thing is, that saves you time, because you don't constantly have to go out and hunt for opportunities. The second great thing about people like Annie being well-connected is they can make stuff happen quicker, because every time they want to make something happen, and some of you will already have this and some of you will want this, they don't have to start from cold connections. They can pick up the phone to a lawyer, an investor, an accountant, a journalist, a business partner, a potential customer, and the person on the end of the line is really pleased to hear from them. So the point of getting connected is to attract opportunities, of course, and also to make stuff happen quicker. So that's the point. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Right. So I thought I'd divvy up the time I've got. I've got a couple of people I'd like you to meet who are some guests I'm going to introduce you to. And I've got a few exercises that I thought we could all, uh, we could all go through as well. Um, here's my take on getting well connected. I think there's a piece of this which is about connecting with people for the first time. And some of that is going to be face-to-face, uh, and some of that is going to be on uh, email. And some of that is going to be online and perhaps on the telephone. So there's a huge piece, if you like, which I want to talk about this afternoon, which is about connecting with people for the first time. Okay? When you've connected with people, and this is why it's called networking, the big challenge is keeping in touch with people. And everybody has their own way of keeping in touch with people. So I'd like you to have a think now because everybody already has a network, and in some cases it will be immensely great, and in others just beginning. But you have today your own techniques for keeping in touch with great people in your network. What are those techniques? I just have four or five suggestions about how you currently do it. We just like to raise your hand. Yes, shout it out. Hang on. You follow them on Twitter, and hopefully they will follow you back. OK, that's a great way to keep in touch. Yes, in the blue shirt and then in the yellow. LinkedIn and Facebook. Excellent. Good way to keep in touch. So either through Twitter or email or however you connect with someone, send them relevant information that may be of interest to them. Excellent. Very good. And just in the red? I'm actually sending them a postcard. Send them a po what, yeah. like an old uh, uh, printed postcard. Fantastic. Very good. OK. What about a few face-to-face -face techniques? Anyone got any techniques they are fond of for, uh, yes, just in the front? Uh, events, so kind of meet up, social events, that kind of stuff. Yep. Grab a coffee, yep. et cetera, et cetera. Excellent, yep. Any other techniques? We'll just get one more here. Inviting him to a party. Say that one again, Joseph. Inviting someone to a party. Invite them to a party, fantastic. You don't even need to organize it. You could be going to someone else's party. Yeah, very good, okay. Any, any other final technique just to think about? Yes. Well. Can't afford dinner parties, so I organize picnics. Picnics, very good, exactly. Bring a rug and all gather around for a picnic. Fantastic, really good technique, okay. So here's one thing to think about. I think all of those online techniques are fantastic. I would encourage you to think, though, about your own businesses and how much of what you share about your plans online, okay? My experience is most of the most successful people I know don't always share what they're going to do online, okay? And that leads me to two conclusions. Firstly, how important it is to get face-to-face, -face, which is why events are so important. Secondly, why it's so important 
to ask great questions. And thirdly, on the flip side, why it's so important to hint at what you're doing and what you want to do when you're online, when you're on Twitter, when you're on LinkedIn, even when you're on Facebook. Because some of the most exciting and amazing plans are hidden from people. <coughs> so here is my uh, sort of, uh, sort of w way of looking at the world. Uh, and I've got a, I've got a few, uh, I've got a few uh, sort of techniques, if you like, uh, of stuff uh, that I wish uh, that I wish I'd known. I'll tell you how my first business started because this helps to set the scene. I was sitting in a bedroom in Leeds, uh, Leeds University, uh, and I had just started my own business. Uh, hands up, who started their business when they were a student? No, student entrepreneurs, okay. So I'm sitting in my bedroom. My business was organizing events for students. So it was like an alternative careers business. Uh, we had events, firstly in Leeds, and then in nine different cities. And I didn't know the first thing about how to advertise my events. Because I wanted to get them to the widest possible audience, but I didn't know what was appropriate, what was legal, uh, or how to put together a decent advert. And I didn't know any friends either who knew anything about advertising. So, would anyone like to have a guess about who I called up, and it wasn't Ghostbusters, but who did I call in the world of advertising? Does anyone think of a well-known name in the world of advertising? Saatchi and Saatchi. It was the only name I knew. So I went to directory inquiries, and I got th put through to Saatchi and Saatchi in London. And I got through to the global marketing director of Saatchi and Saatchi as a student. I asked him a question. I said, can I use the name of a famous person on a poster? And I thought he would slam the phone down. And he said, interestingly enough, it depends if they're dead. I took my question seriously, and he gave me a straight answer. We got talking about my business, and he said, who are you anyway? I said, I'm just a student, to be honest. He said, come and see me, because this sounds interesting. Now, here's what's very interesting about what happened next. I went to see him in London. <clears throat> the next week, and that one meeting led to him introducing me to his clients. It led to over 250,000 pounds of investment from private individuals, which he introduced me to. And he even said at the end of our second meeting, if you're looking for a London office, you can use that disused office down the corridor on the left, provided you don't tell anyone and you keep it a secret. Hmm? Now, friends will know he was fired for gross misconduct uh, two weeks later. No, he wasn't. He, he, he wasn't. He went on to become even more successful than he was. And so, what did I learn from that experience? What I learned from that experience is, take some long shots. Write to people, completely out of the blue. People that you often think will never, ever get back to you. It's easier than ever. I suggest, to connect with people, especially using technology that you have never met before. I got an email response this morning from an email I sent three weeks ago to the office of Sir Terence Conran, a very successful restaurateur, retailer, and British figure. It was a rejection <laughs> from Sir Terence to come and visit a shop which we've helped to start through Startup Britain. However, only because he is too busy this week. His team would like to meet us. I guessed his email address, I wrote to him out the blue, and I just chanced my arm. So whatever your business is, take some long shots, because every single cool business deal I've done, almost without exception, has come from firing off a long shot. And I've got some tips that go with that. When you write to someone completely out of the blue, or tweet them, or send a message through LinkedIn, sometimes they say yes, and sometimes they say no. But most of all, and think back to your own business experience, what do they say? What do they say? Hmm? What do they say? Thank you for your email, if you're lucky. Okay. 
Who's familiar with this? When you write to someone in business, out of the blue for the first time, you hear absolutely nothing. Absol absolutely nothing. Ignored. Okay? That is what happens most of the time in business, isn't it? You get completely ignored. So, the one thing I am going to strongly, strongly, strongly suggest, write to them again. Go into your sent items. Don't apologize. Send exactly the same email again. And if they still haven't come back to you a couple of weeks later, go into your sent items and send the same email again. Straight across their bows. And I promise you, they will go back and tell you, can you just stop emailing me? And they never do. Because what they often do is come back to you and pretend it's the first time it's happened. <laughs> and they finally engage. And I absolutely promise you, none of the cool deals I have ever done have worked from an email first time. Because people are busy. So how can you increase your chances when you're firing out for the first time? Well, number one, just send it again. The second one is get the timing right. Why are you emailing this person, investor, retailer, potential partner, collaborator for your business, why are you emailing them on this day? It's a Wednesday afternoon, it's almost three o'clock. Why now and why them? You've got to make it up, yeah? So my advice is come up with every excuse about why now and why them. And here's my top tip. And I'm going to say it on stage, but keep it a secret. Set up free Google alerts and track people. I didn't say stalk people. I said track people. Go to google.com slash alerts and set up in inverted commas the top 20 people you're keeping an eye on who you want to make an amazing change to your business. That means every time they appear on the web or in the news, you'll get a free email into your inbox. And that can give you the edge on timing. Dear Sir John, I really liked what you wrote this morning in the Telegraph. I think you're right. Dear Tony, congratulations on your award. It's richly deserved. We're also interested in climate change. Yeah? Timing. And believe me, when someone writes an op-ed in The Guardian, you think they're inundated. They're not. They get about four emails sometimes, and yours will be one of them. So time your introductions and name drop in your emails like crazy. If you can think of anything that links you with that person, it might be a mutual friend, it might be a shared interest, it might be a place that you saw them speak. Dear Vint, I saw you speak at campus party. I thought you were inspirational. I'm sorry we didn't get to meet. That will draw you closer together. So be shameless about how you take your long shots. Persist and get your timing right, but cheat by tracking people in a really smart way. Every time, it will help you, because somebody will go, thank you, you've acknowledged that I'm busy, and you've timed it well. So those are a couple of thoughts, if you like, about keeping in touch with people for the first time. Now, I'm conscious that we've only got a limited time uh, this afternoon. So I sort of wanted to, we've got plenty of time sort of uh, for questions at the end, but I've got a couple of people I wanted to uh, introduce uh, you to uh, because I also want to get their sort of uh, tips and techniques. I can see them massing. Oh, I'm going to go, hello, Steve. Now, I might get Emily up first, actually. I want you to welcome someone to the stage because I'm going to quiz her, actually. Uh, would you welcome Emily Brooke? <laughs> Hello, Emily Burke. Hello, Oliver. It's very nice to see you. Thank you for coming down. Uh, so I should have said a, a, a formal introduction, but for those of you who don't know Emily, and Emily, you're going to be impressed with this. Really? Do you see what I've got for you? No. Watch this. You tell me this is the wrong photo now, won't you? Oh, very good. There you go. It is, but uh, great. <laughs> Emily, Emily can be too modest about her, her, her own company. Emily has invented the most fantastic, uh, well, started a company which will deliver world-class cycle products selling to the whole world. And your first product projects a laser, doesn't it? Tell us, yes. tell us what it does. Um, so we're Blaze, and we do innovative products for urban cyclists. And we're launching with a laser light, which tackles the biggest cause of cyclist fatality, which has been caught in the blind spot. So to prevent vehicles in front of you turning across your path, it's a bike light. It's a normal front white light, but it also has a green laser, and it projects the symbol of a bike just in front of you onto the road. Really simple idea, very big problem. Excellent. 
and you are now manufacturing? Yes, we've just pushed the button on mass production literally this week. Uh, tens of thousands of dollars gone off to China for tooling, which is terrifying, yeah. but good. <laughs> now, there are particularly, there are three quick things I just thought I wanted to quiz you about because I want to talk more about how you keep in touch with people, particularly getting in touch with people for the first time. You have been through a fantastic, I think, crowdfunding experience. Yes. Okay. In terms of anything you learned about connecting with people through that, what do you wish someone had told you a couple of years ago? Um, Kickstarter, if you're not familiar, is, is awesome. I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, we used it for three reasons. For the proof of concept, so we got those people to prove that this is actually a good idea by putting hands in pockets and, and paying for it. But also, these guys are our early supporters. So we, we had 872 people who backed us on Kickstarter, and they're our earliest fans, they're our biggest supporters. They, they've got feedback, good and bad, about the product, which was completely invaluable. I mean, these guys are literally paying us for our market research. Things like they wanted it to be USB charge, so we built that in. And we've like, we engage them and we talk to them often and they get horribly long, waffly updates from me on where the product is and where we are. And yeah. they've, um, we, we can ask them questions. And, and that, that community, straight off the back of Kickstarter, has been a real boost to, to starting this up. Right. And is all of your interaction with those people then online or can you meet them face to face? Um, it's mainly online. We've met them a couple of times. So there's been a couple of bits of press where they've wanted to meet Kickstarter backers. And they've all stuck up their hands, so they've come for an interview in London or, or done that a couple of times. We are going to be doing a big launch um, at the end of autumn, um, and we'll invite the Kickstarter backers that can get to London to come and receive their light in the person of our party. Yeah. And um, is there any, uh, or what are the possible benefits of having any relationship with Kickstarter itself, as opposed to just using it as a platform? As in the people behind it? Yeah. Have you needed to do that? Is that... Um, yeah. I think, I mean, there's... Um, Yancy, one of the founders, came over and did a talk, and I, I went and met him, um, and he was very helpful and, and read through. I mean, I got a bit of what you're saying just now about pinging emails. I, I pinged him emails and asked him for feedback on our on our application before we sent it off, and he was very helpful and looked at it and gave us some really good feedback. Yeah. I've got other mates who've gone through Kickstarter, and again, I've managed to link them into him, and he's helped them out, and yeah. that, it's been really helpful. Yeah. Okay. Now, I know that this is a, an ongoing process, but... Have you had any experience of dealing perhaps with angel investors, private individuals? And if you have, is there anything you wish someone had told you about that? Because that's a different type of connecting, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I've, we've raised a couple of small seed rounds of investment and we've got a bunch of angels and, and now some bigger guys involved. Um, and I, I mean, I, all the things you get told that it takes longer than you think and it's a pain in the ass and all that kind of stuff is all definitely very true. Um, I, I'm quite glad actually... No, the opposite. I was never told to do anything different. So I, I'd rock up in my bike helmet and looking scruffy and, and do my own thing. And um, I wouldn't prepare for a pitch at one of the big venture capital funds. And, and it's all worked out quite well. So I just, you know, I just, I should know, be, be yourself and get on with it. And, and, and be, be yourself. Well, I remember the famous, famous story with Richard Branson turning up to his bank in a scruffy jumper and told my his business partner we look desperate if we're in a suit. No, my bank, I get furious. My bank tell me to ask for my signature and... Uh, re-double check that I am actually the founder of my company and I do own that bank account. Yes, I know I look scruffy and I know I'm a young girl and I've got hot pants and a bike helmet on my arm, but yes, it is. <laughs> Please believe me. Now, you've also got an experience. We're on a wire stage, which is a fantastic accelerator program. You went through another type of accelerator. Just tell us quickly, was it interesting, worth it, and what would you say to anyone thinking of applying to one of these? Yep, I went through Entrepreneur First, um, which started last year, um, an accelerator for top graduates wanting to build a business rather than go in the city. And it was fantastic, really, really fantastic. It was the first year, so we got to have a bit of say in how it was formed and how it was run. But the network they've got, to talk about network, is it, fantastic and yeah. some of the most valuable people I've met. I mean, I've never done this before. I've never run a business. I've never manufactured. I've never uh, done any branding, grown a team, taken investment. All this stuff that I'm figuring out this year, because I've been doing this full time since September, has been massively helped through Entrepreneur First, the teaching and the network that they've given me. Yeah. And on that, you've recently been out to Taiwan. Any tips about connecting with people, particularly overseas? Did you use any advisors, any help? Um, what, did, what would you do differently as, again? Get some advice from somebody who's done it lots before. So yeah. Matt is my designer and has been out to China dozens of times um, and would tell me, you know, Emily, don't, don't say no to the food. <laughs> it's really rude. Or, Emily, don't, don't do this. Whatever I was doing, was, uh, was I got the advice to do it otherwise. Okay. And for example, Japan, I was about to jump on a plane last week to go to Japan and kick butt with one of our sources because of, of one of the components of the lights. And I got the advice, don't, as a single female um, coming out here without speaking the language or knowing really too much about the culture, yep. uh, you won't be taken seriously, so find somebody on the ground. So yeah, so 
get advice from people who know the culture and know the people you're dealing with better than you. Excellent. No, that's really helpful. Now, I have to say, knowing you um, sort of, sort of uh, uh, as a mate as well, you work, I'm not just saying this, phenomenally hard. I mean, God knows hard. how many hours. Very hard. However, you also occasionally will go to a networking event. Yeah? Yes. How do you decide which to go to, which is a challenge we all face, and how to make the most of your time when you're actually at an event. And I don't even know whether you love or hate those events, by the way, but you seem to enjoy them, and yet you're very Hard. choosing about which <laughs> ones to go to. Um, really, I'm really bad all, all around at picking, using my time outside of the office. Um, it's awful, but I kind of think that the events where there's going to be lots of my friends at, and I can see <laughs> <laughs> multiple friends at one so time. There's two birds with one stone. Yeah, kind yeah. of. <laughs> um, is, are great. Um, and... Yeah, I, I, I break myself for not being better at finding time to see people one-on-one -on -one outside of yeah. those events. Yeah, okay. But having said that, in terms of the investors that you've talked to, have any of those come through an event or did you know them already? Because it can be tough, can't it, if we're looking to raise cash and we don't have in our existing contact book. Any, any thoughts there? Yes, they have all come through. All the, late, the latest round, um, who are the, the big guys, they've all come through events. So mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to have a demo at Founders, um, Founders Forum. So I was demoing Blaze Light there. Um, and you know, one minute I've got Richard Branson walking around, the next minute I've got um, Ashton Kutcher, of all people, um, and all sorts of you know, really awesome people who came and checked it out. So that was yeah. completely invaluable. So here's a good example. I just saw Vince Surf earlier, wandering around as you do. When you get yourself, uh, I once stood next to Jeff Bezos at a urinal. That's another story. Uh, but when you do find yourself in that moment yep. with a big wig, yep. how do you make the most of that and not guff it up? Um, I go bowling up and be like, hi, I'm Emily, check out this, and just <laughs> show them my product or talk about it or just... I'm, I'm pr I'm my mother's motto in life is you don't get if you don't ask. So yeah. I ask. And you've got a great physical product. However, I think even if you've got an app or something to have an example on your phone. Yeah, yeah, have something they can show them and they can engage with. Because even if it's even if they're not deciding whether they want to engage with you, they can basically decide if they want to engage with what you're looking at. Is that right, Emily? Very good. Yes, there very you go. good. You see, I've done my homework, yeah. haven't I, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah, and you're quite engaging on Twitter as well, so you ain't ignore us all, will you? No. Okay, has anyone got a quick question for Emily? Now we've got her here about her experiences with Blaze. It could be anything. It could be about her crowd funding or about the product itself. Yes, in the front row. How much did you raise through Kickstarter? That's the question. How much did I raise through Kickstarter? We wanted to raise £25,000 in a month, and we did that in less than five days. We went on to raise fifty-five grand. Um, we were one of the first UK companies on the site, um, so I'd love to have seen what that would have looked like if we were in America. But still, please. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. And would you consider doing another crowdsourced round? Yeah, definitely. I think Kickstarter, sadly, isn't going to be around for physical products for much longer as okay. it is. Okay. I think it's going to change. But um, it, yeah, I definitely would do it again. Excellent. No, that's really helpful. Any other final question, by the way? Yes, just one there, and we'll do one more there. Yeah, go on. So you did the Entrepreneur First program, but why did you take that leap of faith? Um, I designed Blaze at university, and um, I uh, got sent an entrepreneurial scholarship to America, which kind of kicked the whole entrepreneurial thing off. Um, and uni wanted to send out a press release. Um, within two days, it was on every cycling blog in the UK, and then Sydney Morning Herald by the end of the week. But I, I just knew I wanted to, I made the decision I wanted to do this, and I wanted to build it, build my own thing. Um, and I just saw Entrepreneur First as a really, really awesome kind of kick up the bum to do that, um, and a, a bonus and, and golden ticket, so grabbed it. Excellent, good question. And we've got just a final one here. Yes, Danny? Not on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> yes, possibly. Yeah, there's been a bunch. It's a really big problem, um, yeah. and it's, it's very talkable. There's been a lot of press, which has been awesome. It's all been incoming, but it's, yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah. this is, uh, Emily's been featured in some newspapers. In fact, you're in the Sunday Times recently. And question, has that led to traction for the business? Yes. So we can see on the website, especially when Kickstarter was live, where everyone was coming through and bidding, and it'll be an article on Telegraph, boom, we can suddenly see the backers coming in. Um, and yeah, we, can, we get questions which are literally people say, I saw you in an article in. It's, it's obvious. Yesterday, we spent the day down in Brighton doing a film for CNN. They're doing a four-minute feature on Blaze, which is awesome. Yeah. Really, really excellent. Emily, thank you so much. I know you're up speaking you're a bit welcome. later on a UKTI stage about your international adventures. Uh, we will follow your adventures uh, with interest. But thank you very much, Emily Brooke. Thank you. Thanks, Em. Let me see. I, I'll grab that. Sorry.
Thank you. Very good. Well, I think it's a good idea, isn't it, uh, to, to, to have a couple of, uh, a couple of guests up, because it gets us uh, thinking, and then I can pepper in uh, some of my own uh, insights uh, as, as, as we go, and then, and, and then get you going a bit more. Now, um, I've got a confession to make. Uh, when I'm out and about in London, very occasionally, someone will say something nice about me uh, by telling the person we're talking to that I know loads of people. And I always slightly smile, and I go, yeah, but... If you want to know who really knows everyone, it's the person I'm going to introduce you to now. Uh, and I've got questions for him too. Uh, now, this is someone who's worn a number of hats in his life. I met him when he was weaving amazing projects and programs, many of them award-winning together for Channel 4. So he's passionate about education. And he's equally at home in a Greasy Spoon cafe in Shoreditch as he is behind the black door of Number 10 Downing Street. He's recently started an amazing project which will make sure that we don't forget or waste the legacy of London 2012 because it's called Britain's Personal Best, which encourages us all to set a personal goal and smash it out of the park in whatever personal way that means to us. So I'd like you to give a round of applause and welcome someone I'm going to quiz, Steve Moore. <laughs> Hello, Steve. Good to see you, Marco. Very good. Now, Steve, you tell me if this is the right or the wrong one. That's good. That's good. It's got lots of things to do. Can we work with that? That's good. Um, you can hear me okay? Thanks. Thanks, Ollie. Hello, everyone. Hi, that's good. Um, do you want me to kick off? Yeah, well, I can, well you, you kick off if there are thoughts top of mind, because I, I, I have thinking, very specific questions about, for you, Steve. Um, when Ollie was describing his experience of reaching out to Saatchi, like all those years ago, and I was telling a story recently about how this latest project of mine kicked off and it's, kind of in, it's probably quite insightful in the context of what we're talking about here today. And um, back in my, with my old hat on about two years ago, I was asked to put together a paper for the Prime Minister who was going away on the way day, raising some issues about some big policy issues. And I raised the question in there about the Olympic legacy for London and whether enough was being done to make the most of what was likely to be an incredible national celebration last summer here in London and across the UK. And this raised some shackles among a lot of people, because an awful lot of people felt that the legacy was all okay, everything was being perfectly planned, and so on. And then a couple of weeks later, I went and invited a couple of series of meetings in and around Whitehall, and people were expressing some concern about whether the legacy, because remember, London won the Olympics in 2012 based on the promise of a legacy. In 2005, they went to Singapore as underdogs and competed with all the other nations. Most people expected Paris to win the Olympics, and London took to the stage. Uh, Seb Coe took to the stage with a 1,000 kids from around this area in East London and promised to create an inspire generation. And that message was so powerful and uh, so resonant. It was the basis on which London won the Olympics. And I was just merely questioning whether enough was being done. The question I was asking was, are we doing as much to build, on the, build a legacy from the games as we are to actually deliver the games. And a few weeks later, I, I, was, I went to breakfast in Bloomsbury and I had a breakfast with a TV presenter. And she expressed, she's a very uh, famous sports presenter and she was very concerned about the legacy too. And she was saying like, I don't think enough's been done. I don't think enough, I go to schools, I give inspirational talks to schools, I can't see enough being done. So we come up with an idea, which is the, uh, this idea here, and um, we left the cafe. And on the way on leaving the cafe, which is about 11 o'clock in the morning, I happened to phone up a guy called Fred Turek. Fred's the founder of LA Fitness. He's now the chair of LA Fitness, and he's the chair of the Fitness Industry Association here in the UK. He's a big player in any, any debates around health, fitness, and well-being. I phoned him up and said, Fred, I've got this amazing, brilliant idea. He said to me, where are you? And I said, I'm in Bloomsbury. He said, so am I. It's our industry conference today. Come round and present it. I said, well, the idea is about 20 minutes old. He said, it doesn't matter. Come round. I'm underwhelmed by the speakers. I want you to come round and present the idea. <laughs> so I turned to Charlie and said, what are you doing for the next hour? She said, I'm not quite sure. He said, well, we're just going to go and present the idea to the entire fitness industry association. OK, let's do it. So an hour later, John Inverdale, who's a popular sports presenter here in the UK, cleared the stage of various Olympians and key sports people. And Charlie and I put the stage and said, we've decided we've got a solution to the Olympic legacy problems. And we pitched the idea. And it was a double-edged sword because we pitched the idea and immediately we had, a, we had to be faithful to that idea. And we had a commitment to make it happen, even though it was a very warm idea. 
but secondly, it caused consternation among people who were officially managing the legacy that we had the audacity to step up and say, well done for so far, but we think we can do better. And since then, and then basically 18 months later, I took to the stage of the orbit uh, at the Olympic Park with Zeb Co uh, a few weeks ago and announced that Britain's personal best will be launched. And the first weekend is coming up in a month's time. So if you go on whatsyours.org, you can register your own personal best. Fantastic. And how long was that timeline then, from that first breakfast to the, to the launch? The, the timeline, so the timeline, it, it took 18 months and it felt like 18 years. Because you've got to be really patient with big ideas. And the prob I guess the issue that for the sort of people who come to events like this, entrepreneurs like us and Ollie and others, is that you get bitten by big ideas. And you become infected by big ideas. You become, and they own you. And you've got an obligation to see them through. And it, you, and it gets frustrating when other people who've got other things in their inbox can't give you the, all the time you need to help your idea come to fruition. And you need a special type of belligerence to do that. Yeah. And one of the things I always say to young people when they grow up is that not everybody is blessed with those kind of indefatigable qualities that stick through things, that get over the hurdles, that are resilient. And, and it's not everyone that can achieve that. But in this case, we felt, and we built it in a network, and it's important in the context of this, because the, the confidence that we got was when we started talk, we talked to people and people said, yes, that's a great idea, and I'm not sure what else is happening in the legacy. And every conversation we had with individuals gave us the, con con the, c the conviction to keep going mm. and taking it further and so on. And now, it's not a, now an official legacy project. Now, I've got some very quick fire questions for you, Steve, okay? yep, because it. you know literally thousands of people and you have an uncanny yep. way of making <laughs> stuff happen. How do you even decide who to keep in touch with? You go to an event, you collect 50 business cards, yeah. And what happens next? So how do you go about it? Um, well, I've improved how I do these things over the years because uh, 10 years ago, I would have made a, a, a decent attempt to engage with, with people and try to find time to connect with all sorts of people off if I'd gone something like that. And often you'd, you'd come back from an event and people ha would have, you would come back the, and the next morning there'd be lots of emails in your inbox and invitations to LinkedIn and people want to follow up with you and have coffee and things like that. Um, and I would say probably for many years, I quite faithfully got up, went about finding time to do that and then looked at different ways of making it efficient and things like that. I suppose nowadays I'm more discerning about what I would do and I have to, I mean, I would be, and that means that I might look a bit promiscuous sometimes, but basically I've got to be quite ruthless of where I go. So at the moment, my focus in terms of networking would be on things which support the kind of objective and the ambitions of this project. So a lot of my networking at the moment is with people who are working in the kind of sports field and the fitness field, the big challenge events and things like that. But the great thing about that is that you're constantly renewing and enriching your relationships. So most of the people I'm working with at the moment and have done over the last three, four months, I didn't know a year ago. Mm. And I think I find that quite stimulating and I know that Ollie does too. Yeah. And you've got a habit of getting some very well-known people involved with your projects. Anything you've learned about that, whether that's the big hitting investor, yep. it could be the celebrity to front it. Yep. I touched a little bit earlier on the cold calling and some tips I've picked up, but a a yep. anything which you wish someone had told you? I think what I've learned over the years is that if you are an ideas person and you're generally spending your whole time working and developing ideas and they're bubbling up in your head and your, your head's tumbling with the, the ambi your ambitions, it's easy to reach someone and get to someone else who likes your ideas and get to them, and they love the idea too. But the real key is building the capability below you to actually deliver. Because actually when it goes to an investor, it goes and that they have got people below them who will be doing very, very rigorous diligence and assessment. And, they, and you need to be able to match the rigor of their assessment with the quality of the team that you've got underneath you. And I, I think that the key is always to be able to find your foil. At the moment, I've, achieved, I've actually changed my job. Although people refer to me as the chief executive of this, I don't think to call myself the chief executive, I call myself the chief creative officer because actually I've got someone who day to day runs yeah. this for me, makes most of the critical operational decisions day by day, and I step back from that. But I, I think moving more quickly to develop operational capability to support the delivery of idea is yeah. important. Ideas themselves won't charge enough. And I think for, for some of the audience here, actually, the, the lure of government, I don't mean going into yeah. politics, but when the minister or the civil servant takes a shine to your technology yep. idea or project, that could yeah. be uh, a flattering and attractive thing. It could yeah. also be a world-class waste of time. So <laughs> how, how can you leverage it when you cross paths with government, whether that's locally or nationally, in a way that doesn't leave you as a, as a startup out of pocket and feeling like you've had your time wasted? 
I think what my advice would be, don't be seduced by politicians. Power rests with other people. It all rests with officials in Whitehall. Politicians come and go. Their briefs changes from time to time. It's fantastically uh, enticing to be, in, to be invited into event to, to meet politicians. They are always looking for breakthrough ideas. If you bring them ideas, they will bring, they'll encourage you to come forward and bring things forward. But it's like any other thing. It's, it's a very, there's a lot of short-termism in that politics. You can be in for briefly and then you can be out again, things like that. And I think in some ways business is a more honest environment than politicians. Mm -hmm. Politicians shift and change. Some, sometimes you're in, sometimes you're out. I'm old enough to have worked with uh, four governments over the last 20 years. Sometimes you're in favour, sometimes you're out of favour. I think in some ways I would keep the main focus in the delivery of business and the customer experience rather than being too seduced by politicians. Okay, well I've got an exercise coming up which I'm going to get everyone involved in in a minute, Steve, but you uh, go to uh, your fair share of good events. Yeah. Top tip when you're hitting that event and you want it to be a productive as well as a fun experience. You want to come out and you could loyally say to your investors or your business partners, that was good for business. Yeah. Um, so I would say you would come to the event. Uh, so selecting events is important as well. Selecting events, go to, I think it's important to go to events where you're going to be exposed to new ideas and new people. It's very easy and it's much easier to go to events where you know lots of people and you have lots of friends and you're going to be, you're going to be exposed to ideas that you're broadly familiar with. And often it's easier if you can go to an event where you can engage in subjects that you're an expert in or know a lot about. I think it's much more challenging to go to events where you know fewer people, you're more exposed to, uh, uh, but also I think it's much more invigorating. And I find mm. increasingly that I sp try to spend my time going to events. And I, my, my, I met a guy recently uh, at St. James's Capital called Mike Davis, an incredibly inspiring person who's helped us a lot with this project. And he has a brilliant um, maxim he lives by, and it's his 10 a month theory. We're going to publicize this in a few months' time. And Mike basically sets himself a challenge on the first day of every month to, get, to learn 10 do th new things every month or to do 10 things he's never done before every single month. And he spends every morning, ev starts every day, checking off his list of the 10 things. And I think I would apply that to something like coming to an event like this. Mm. Set yourself a little small target. I want to make three people that I'm going to build a relationship with. Yep. And I want to have three ideas. I want to take th ideas, three ideas from the O2 arena and look at ways in which they can help and support my, develop, develop my existing business or any new ideas I have. Excellent. Yeah. Very good. I could quiz you all afternoon. I hope you're going to stay for a bit, but thank you very much, Steve Moore. Thank you, Steve. Now, speaking of which, uh, at events, I've got a bit of a, I've got, I've got two quick things uh, which I'd like us to practice. And one, which I'm going to give you a bit of notice on, uh, involves uh, your fantasy list of three people, or up to three people, that if everything went right for your business, you would have a coffee with these three people. Who would they be? They could be that organization you really want to get into. It could be that dream investor. It could be someone you'd secretly like to work with. But if everything went right, who emails you next Monday morning and asks for a quick coffee? I've heard about what you're doing. I think it sounds fantastic. Have you got time for a quick coffee? So even if you're working within a large organization right now, who would that be? Who would those three people be? And I'm going to give you a minute to think about that because first, I've got a theory. Now, hands up when you go to networking events. Hands up if you're like, let me add them. I can't think of anything better than going into an event full of people I don't really know. Hands up who really quite likes that. Yeah, good. And hands up who, frankly, pretty much dreads that. Not for, not for me. <laughs> I don't like this at all. No, okay. And if you're somewhere between, somewhere between... Depends on the day, depends on the mood. All right, okay. Right, I'm going to get everyone to stand up uh, because we're just going to practice something uh, very quickly. And can I just have a quick reminder? Uh, we're welcoming lots of people from all over the world today, but hands up if, we're, uh, hands up if you're British. Brits, okay, now I'm going to say something at the moment. Uh, Brits, you can, uh, you can kick me later. I'm going to say something a little bit racist against our own country. I don't think we're always amazing at networking at events, okay? And I think there's a couple of issues. I think that we can be a little bit rubbish at saying hello to people. Yeah. And here's the other bit, which uh, I get accused of being too American for. We're sometimes not great at saying goodbye to people. And some of you will know what it feels like to get stuck at an event, sometimes for half an hour or 45 minutes, talking to the same person until the fire alarm goes off 
or you really need the bathroom, or one of you really has run out of a drink for the fifth time, and you just can't get away. So my theory is, if you can get good at saying, yeah, you, can, you, can, uh, you can join us in the, in the, uh, in the, in the gallery, that's good. Uh, but my theory is, if you can get good at saying goodbye to people at events in a non-crass, non-rude way, you can quadruple the number of cool people you meet in a morning or an afternoon or an evening event. So what we're going to do, just for fun, in a few minutes, is I want you to meet someone you've never met before. And then one of you is going to have to go first, but I want you also to say, and here's my tip, and the first time you do this, guys, I'm warning you, it's going to feel a little bit crude, okay? But just, to, just come here, sir. Okay, I'm going to encourage you to say at some point words to this effect. Well, look, it's been fantastic to meet you. Uh, and what, one thing I do at events is I say, look, I know you've got loads of other people you want to meet. And their eyes light up and they go, oh, thank God for that. Yeah. Uh, you say, I know you've got other people you want to meet and uh, maybe we'll see each other later. Whatever, you make it up. Yeah. But something that feels kind of cool, doesn't feel rude and just allows you then to go on and meet someone else. Yeah. And I just want you to experience how that feels. Some of it's going to feel, oh, that was awful. And some of it's going to go, absolutely, next person, yeah? So just for a few minutes, and I'm not going to blow a whistle or anything to get you to change, but as and when, one of you's going to break for it. See if you can beat them to the punch. Okay, but just see what it's like. Four or five changes, and we're going to see how it's gone. Ready, steady, go. Good luck, everyone, right? Okay, in your own time, in your own time, campus party, when you feel ready. <laughs> Hey, very good to meet you. How are you? What's your name? I'd like to see a couple more moves. Ah, hello, Chris. How are you? <laughs> no twerking on stage. <laughs> You've got a panel in a minute, haven't you? Okay, everybody, thank you very much. And if you come back and have a seat. Thank you, have a sit down, have a sit down. Thanks, have a seat, have a seat, come down. Thank you. Okay, now, uh, hands, up, uh, hands up if you uh, just count, count the number of goodbyes. Hands up if you said uh, uh, goodbye to one person in that session. One person, fair enough. Hands up if you said goodbye to two people. Here we go. Hands up if you said goodbye to three people. Well, now we'll get down to it. And four? Four. Benjamin Southworth, come down here. Can I have a round of applause? Ben. Come down here, come down here. You are the ultimate schmoozer, Ben. I think that's amazing. I would never have thought this would happen, no. actually. Now, Ben, t t tell us your technique. Um, I try and be as nice as possible without being rude, which sounds different, right? So the trick is you want to be overly Britishly nice, like ridiculously nice, like Ollie has big eyebrows, I have stupid face. And what I do is I just <laughs> go over the top 
but not too far that you look like you're taking the sarcastic piss out of people. <laughs> and that's, that's the kind of trick, which is genuinely be excited to have met that person and then be really excited that they've got something better to do. And I find that really yeah. works. And, and that's fine. And did, did anyone feel as they were going round that it felt quite all awkward, actually, saying goodbye to people as they went round? Anyone feel a certain, I can see you nodding. So let's just get your take on it there. Yeah, I've done it a lot. I've been to a load of networking in, uh, networking sessions and you do find yourself stuck with people. So saying goodbye nicely, I still haven't cracked it. I, yeah. still, I still chat for too long to the same people. So I'll go to a networking event and talk to maybe two or three You're people. still working on it. And who, thank you for that honesty. And did anyone, did anyone actually find it quite natural to just say, well, that's great to meet you and you didn't find that? Yeah, well, t t tell us, tell us what, any tips you'd pass on about it. Um... Well, I don't know. In terms of tips, it's a question of if, if you can give them value and then give you value, then staying in a conversation makes sense. But if there's no actual value for either one of you, then you both kind of know that. So you can just kind of move on. Ah, right. So I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But OK, no, that's a fair enough take on it. OK. So one thing I think on these things is when you've had a conversation, I'm not talking about a one minute, but maybe a five or ten minute conversation at somewhere like Campus Party. If you feel that you'd like to keep in touch with that person, try and think of the one thing that's cropped up. I've just met somebody who's got a charitable foundation uh, which is supporting other people and he has a new shopping related startup. Now, I'd like to hear more because it hasn't yet got a name. So when it has got a name, okay, uh, perhaps I'd give a view on it or help him in some way. So I might remember that. Is it Radu? Yeah, so I might remember that and I'll say as part of my goodbye line at an event, as and when you've got a couple of potential names, Drop me a note, I'd love to hear more. Yeah? So you think of something from your conversation. If you ever want to know the name of that sushi bar or send me a link to that website, let's do that. And you use that and psychologically they think, great, this is an absolutely useful thing that this conversation's ending on and you're off. Okay? If you can get good at saying goodbye to people at networking events, you will quadruple the value you get out of any one event. And by the way, one nice line to use, which doesn't seem too rude, I don't think, is Perhaps I'll see you later on before the end of the night. Or I'll see you later on in campus party. I bet you've got loads of people you want to meet. And you often do. So it doesn't seem weird. It's like, oh, no, I'm meeting him again. This is really embarrassing. It's like, hey, how's it all going? And just make those encounters really short and sharp. OK, so that's the most practical thing when you're going into a room full of people. By the way, if you know who's hosting, it's a bit more difficult at the O2, but if you know who's hosting the event, make a beeline for them early on in the event. Go and introduce yourself. Try to get out of their space as quickly as possible in a polite way, but just thank them for having you. Remind them who you are. Say, hey, thank you so much for having me, Radu. My name's Oli. I'm uh, really grateful to be here. And that's a good opportunity to ask them who's here. Seem like some amazing people. Who's here? And that's Radu's opportunity to go, hey, uh, you probably know Ben already. Yeah? And the host will guide you to some of the most interesting people in the room really quickly. And then, guess what? I'm going to say, hey, Ben, Radu sent me over. I hope you don't mind. Really, really quick technique for getting in and around a room. So it's a bit brutal. It's a bit crude. But in my opinion, it will really deliver brilliant value for you. Now, I asked you about 10 minutes ago to think of three people that you would love to have a business coffee with. So what I'd love you to do is just turn to the person beside you and in a couple of minutes, just share with each other who would be on your top three list. And that could be because they're a potential ambassador. It could be because they're in an organization you really want to work with. It could be your dream investor. And I'm not just talking about rock stars here. It could be an intensely practical person. I want to meet the buying manager at Sainsbury's supermarket. Whoever it is that you think could have a transformative effect on the startup you're dreaming of or that you're already running, who would it be? So turn to the person next to you and just tell them who's in your top three. We've got two minutes to do that. Good to see you again. How are you? You're right, very good.
All right, thank you very much. Okay, so thank you. So I've asked you to think of uh, up, to, up to three people you'd love to have that quick coffee with. And what I thought we'd do, just as, a, just as a bit of a gang here, see if we can help each other. And I'm not saying that means, oh yes, I'll definitely introduce you tomorrow or anything. I'm not, I'm not expecting anyone to do that. But if you hear someone's dream meeting and you have any thought about how they could get even one step closer to that person, I'd like you to consider sharing it with them this afternoon. So who wants to kick off? Who's got a list? And you'll soon work out that it's quite a good thing to share your list because you never know what could happen. But tell, tell us who's on your hit list, sir. Is it on? Yep. Yeah, it's on. The gentleman next to me wants to meet you. Oh, great. Excellent. That can be arranged. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm up for that. Any, anyone else? Um, I've got Richard Branston. Br not Branson, not, the not pickle Branson. merchant. Branson. No. <laughs> <laughs> Both of them. Excellent. <laughs> okay, good. No, and, and that's you that want to meet him? Yeah. He does a lot for charity. I've mm. got an, a charitable idea. Okay. He's a big ambassador of startups. Yep, okay. So, so, so Rich Branson, the top of the tree. And anyone else? Uh, Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> now, this is for strictly business reasons, I hope. She could promote the product, why not? Yeah, absolutely. Why? What is the product? Uh, well, there's too many. I don't know which one yet. There's loads of products. Okay, okay, loads of pro okay. Loads Excellent. Right, well, we'll dwell on those. Thank you. We've got, I, got, I want some tips on meeting him because uh, our previous speaker knows him. Go on. Who I'd like to meet? Yes. Uh, Ronan Dunn. Ronan Dunn, uh, Chief Executive uh, of O2 in the UK, yes. Um, also a quick hint, uh, Phelan Mackle. Yes, exactly. <laughs> a quick reminder. <laughs> also, I'm just joking. Excellent. Anyone else? Um, Mike Adenuga. He's a Nigerian billionaire who heads up the top uh, mobile company in Nigeria. And I think my proposition would be of use to Nigeria. Excellent. So, so, so Mike, who's a, who's a very Adenuga, well investor. Yeah. Okay. okay, excellent. Anyone else got a top three? Yes, we'll go here. Just shout them out. Okay, um, it was, oh yeah, sorry. The head of, the head of Evan Cycles, or like a cycling brand. Yep. The second one was head of Oxford City Council. Yes. And the third one is Chris Hoy. Chris Hoy? Yeah. Your product hasn't got anything to do with cycling at all, has it? No, no, nothing to What's do. What's it called? I, I, don't, I don't have a name yet. Okay, but give us a gist, can you tell yeah, us something so about it? Elevator pitch. It's developing a platform which enables troubled youths to become more employable and enables students to get their bikes fixed. Fantastic. Love it. What a great elevator pitch, by the way. <laughs> Excellent. Love that. Very good. Okay. So we've had a few there, haven't we? We've had uh, Richard Branson. We've had the head of Oxford Council. We've had Chris Hoy. We've had Mike Adenuga. We've had Ronan Dunn, uh, who runs O2 in the UK. Who's got a practical suggestion that might take us closer to any one of those? Yes, just shout a couple out. I've, I've got two that are quite direct. Um, oh, I've you're coming up with someone you want to meet now? Yeah. All oh, right, well, let's have sorry, those, but I want your suggestions as well helpfulness as well. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I've got Raj Raman Nandi. He's an um, angel investor Okay. Um, from London. Okay. And also the director of Waira. Yes. Yeah. What, globally? <laughs> um, no, Waira UK. Okay, so yeah. maybe Simon. Is Simon in Europe? Simon Devonshire? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay, right. So my question to you is, do you follow Simon? Are you on Twitter? Oh, uh, yeah, I am on Twitter. Do you follow Simon Devonshire on Twitter? Yeah, I do. Have you messaged him to say you're here? No. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will in a second, but... Because <laughs> he is here and he's very approachable. Oh, okay. And you just never know. Okay, just tell us that investor's name. Raj Ramanandi. Okay, tell us about him. Is he married? What are his kids called? Um, he is, I think he is married and he's got a, he's got a kid. I follow his blog quite a what's lot. His, what's his kid called? Uh, no, I'm not sure exactly what his kid's called. Okay. Uh, You're keen to meet him? Uh, Richard at theskillsmarket.org. Oh, here we go. This is a live intro here. Ben Southworth is teeing up. All right, cheers. <laughs> okay, well, we've got a bit of help coming, uh, coming live to you here. Yeah. I'm going to go back to, to you, sir, in the short sleeve. I've got a question for you. Uh, Richard Branson, not an easy man to get hold of. No. Tell us about his, fa well, I don't know where I'm going with this one, but family situation. Hasn't he got a daughter that's doing something? Yes, what's her name? I want to say Hannah, but I'm guessing. No. Uh, no, what's Richard Branson's daughter's name? Holly. Holly Branson, excellent. What's his son called? Pass. 
No, I don't think... That's not his name, but I don't know. Sam? Yeah? Yeah. Has Sam recently got married? Yes. Yes, he has. What's his wife's name? Mrs. Branson. Very good. <laughs> Her name is Isabella. Yeah? Who appeared in Dirty Dancing on stage, which was produced by Michael Jacobson, who's a theatre producer who's just written a book called Creative Business. And why I'm being smug about that is that it matters a lot, actually. Uh, because you're much closer to Sam's age than Richard's age. Yeah. And Sam is accessible. Uh, he runs a uh, production, film production company. And him and Holly invest in products. And I think it's really, really important. And it doesn't take long. And that's the most amazing thing about technology. It doesn't take long to get genned up on people. And I'm not talking about being creepy and stalking them. Uh, but I am talking about tuning in to their timing and knowing not literally where they live, but where they hang out. And that's why they were at an event called We Day in Canada, which was part of a brilliant charity called Free the, Free the Children, uh, one year ago, two years ago. And if you were following, which I know you will do, uh, what they're up to and what they're going to say, there is a chance there to cross paths with some of these people, like these investors. So I really, really encourage you. What about Evans? Has anyone got a, a, a thought about Evans Cycles? How would you get to someone at Evans Cycles? LinkedIn, perhaps? Absolutely. LinkedIn, great. Yes, we've got to be passed down here. Yes, in the stripes, yeah. Find their job title and obviously the name and then try to guess their email addresses and use the company pattern. Absolutely. And just try to get an email introduction. If there's no reply, then just keep on sending that <laughs> email. A a a absolutely. Oh, and by the way, when you're calling, uh, some of you will feel more confident on the phone than others. Call the front desk. And act as if, and I'm not encouraging you to fib here necessarily, uh, but just act as if the person you're getting put through to is a very good friend of yours. Yeah? You call with that confidence. They go, hi, can I just speak to, if it's a relatively small company and they've got a relatively unusual name, let's say it's Philippe. Oh, hi there, can I just speak to Philippe's office, please? Straight away. You will almost never get challenged in some of these organizations. Okay? Can I speak to Sir Terence's office? And particularly if you suggest that they've got someone who looks after them, you'll often get through quickly. Okay? Also, if you've been at an event with them and you say, no, I tried to get their email and I've just been trying, I've just got it bounced back. It was um, sam.branson at... And they'll remind you what it was. Yeah? It was really practical. Now, Tobes, how would you get to Evans? Yes, can you... Uh... So, so I'm lucky enough to know quite a few people who work in the cycling industry, and yes. therefore... Up on stage. Sorry. Can we, can, we, can, we, um, can we welcome Toby Cummins to the stage, please? Um, I'm lucky enough to know quite a few people who work in the cycling industry. So um, through one or other of those contacts, and several professional cyclists, so more for the Chris Hoy thing, uh, definitely be very easy to get in touch with. Excellent. So practical help. Also, yeah. So how, are you, how are you enjoying the show so far, by the way, Toby? Fantastic. Fantastic. Any, any, any feedback? Anything you'd like to see a bit more of? Uh, you on stage, actually, because every time you walk forward, we lose you on the internet. I do. I'm sorry about that. That's probably a blessing, actually, for, 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 the, for the world. Uh, okay. So that's very helpful. Thank you, Toby, from Evans. I can also tell you, uh, I don't think it's a state secret, that Emily from Blaze, who you met earlier, has a relationship with Evans uh, as, as a company as well. Not a formal one, I'm not saying, but really good person to pick her brain about that. Who else has got a a wish list that they just like to shout out their three coffees. I want to get a bit more helpfulness. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Hands up who's got someone they'd really love to have a... Yes. One and then two. So if we're doing the white shirt and then at the front here. Hi. Um, yeah, I'd really like to meet a guy called Eben Pagan, who's an information marketer, um, because my business is uh, information business. I, it's called Power PR Program, and I help businesses to do their own PR. Okay. Um, I'd also like to meet James Kahn. I guess yes. uh, probably going to come up quite a few times. Okay. Um, also, just it's mainly just to bounce the idea. I think one of the things I've learned from today is um, not to be too afraid to kind of talk to people about your idea. Okay. Um, I'd also like to meet uh, Richard Branson, right, everyone. But okay. Yeah. Well, we could invite him around, a group yeah, of us. I think we should. Okay, so let me just ask you. Don't, please don't think I'm obsessed with people's children. Uh, James Kahn, hmm? tell me about his family. I think he has two daughters. Uh -huh. uh, and I think I seem to remember, I'm reading his book, and I seem to remember that one of them, uh, he is more keen on in a business sense. <laughs> I don't know about personally. Okay. But, um, well, one of them works with him. And what's okay, her name? That's why. Uh, I don't remember. I okay, her name is Hannah. Okay. okay. What's unusual about her name is it's not spelled with two N's, it's spelled with one N. Okay. And she particularly works on something called a student loans company. 
Do you know about the student loans company? Uh, it gives loans to students to go to university. Uh, not to go to university, but to start a business. Oh, right. Okay. So a typical loan would be four and a half thousand pounds. I'm not talking about the student loans company, am I? I'm talking about the startup loans company. Okay. Sorry. Uh, the startup loans company, 100 million pound pot. Used to be just for under 30s, and that's changing. Uh, and um, very involved with that as a particular scheme, as is he, because he's the chairman of it. So in terms of detecting some of his private passions, uh, a really interesting one to go on on there in terms of some of the supporters. Yes, Annie. To the person who wanted to meet Mr. Simon Devonshire. <laughs> well, here, the man himself. Can we have a round of applause, Simon Devonshire? In the, here he is, Simon Devonshire. Good afternoon, everybody. I've never had a welcome like that before. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. hello. Um, so, who, who is it? Hi, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, How are you finding campus party? Yeah, it's great. How long have you been here for? Ah, that would explain why you look like you've had some sleep and you look reasonably clean. <laughs> Congratulations. So now, Simon, now we've got you here. We've, we've caught you, haven't we? Like a, yeah. like a mouse in a trap. Uh, and, well, not, not, not a, no, a liar, a humane trap, I mean. Okay. okay. We're going to keep you here for one minute because Simon, if you don't know, is the director of WIRA, uh, Telefonica's Accelerator, uh, uh, for the whole of Europe. Except you're also an entrepreneur, Simon. I am, yeah. And right. you used to run a billion pound business for O2, right? I did, yeah. So my question is, how can, quite a big question, how can small work with big and not get crushed? In other words, how can a startup work with a yeah. big company? Well, um, what what are some pra either practical tips or very big, big thoughts on that? Okay, so I think, uh, firstly, I think it's really important that uh, small companies work with really big companies. Um, because particularly from Wire's point of view, we are investing in smaller businesses. Uh, and I think that most small businesses think that their number one objective is to get money. And actually, I think often their number one objective is to get customers. And I think that corporates have the opportunity of fast-tracking their access to customers. And that's what Wire is there to do. But it's difficult. It's difficult for small businesses to work directly with big businesses because they're a bit like boxers. So uh, boxers are classified by weight. And that means that startups would tend to be like a featherweight and a corporate would be like a heavyweight. And often the corporates don't realize the power of their punch. And so the difficulty is they don't intentionally try to do bad things to small businesses. They're just not engineered very well to be that compatible with them. So in order as a small business to do work with a big business really effectively and not get bruised by the possibility of the things that they could do, like for instance, the catastrophic effect of canceling an order, which to the corporate might just be a process thing, but to the small business might mean the death of their business. The thing that helps protect them is to have an ambassador, a champion, somebody who is an advocate of your business within the corporate. And think of that person as a fire alarm. Seniority won't necessarily protect you in the event of a fire. What will protect you is somebody who shouts loudly. So find somebody who's going to shout really loudly, okay? okay and that okay, would okay. be my advice of working a small company, working with a big company. And, and so I guess in some ways that applies to all big companies. And I'm going to ask you a specific one. Stuff um, you'd counsel someone on if they were considering doing a deal, particularly with Telefonic or O2. Is there anything, not peculiar, but is there any, any particular tip you'd give them? Because I'm sure there are uh, many in the audience. Yeah, so um, a lot of small businesses are really well-intentioned and they, um, they try and be as specific as they can about, for instance, their negotiation, their costings, their proposal. What they've not done is walked in the shoes of their customer within the corporate. And the corporate will often not want to know the granular costing, but will want some kind of assurance that this thing uh, is uh, not going to have any surprises to it, particularly financially. And that means making some assumptions and actually coming up with a proposal that you're prepared to stand up to and stand for. And many uh, small businesses, I think, uh, find that very difficult yep. thing to do. Yep. So what they'll do is they'll say, you know, this will cost X amount of money for per unit, but we don't know how many units it is. Yep. And then they find that the corporates are unwilling to engage with them. It's because corporates these days don't have blank checkbooks. 
they want to work within defined parameters. So try yeah. to define the parameters within which you can yeah. work. Excellent. Now my final question, Simon. Wira has invested in hundreds, over 200 businesses across the world. And as well as your investment, it's often alongside private individuals, angels, and so on. Any mistakes that you see startups make when it comes to particularly networking with and connecting with these often well-known but often wealthy private individuals, particularly because this is something that's, I think, come up? Yeah, I think um, whenever you're talking to an individual or a big company in pursuit of their money, my number one tip would be be very respectful. And I'm surprised how often um, uh, entrepreneurs, full of their own ego, ambition, capabilities, and talents, lose sight of the fact that actually, at the end of the day, they're asking for somebody who's perhaps a bit further ahead than them in their journey to impart cash. And I think that's something that requires respect. Peter Jones, interestingly, always wears a suit. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially if there's money involved in the conversation, he will always wear a suit. And I think um, uh, I, I'm not talking to you about money. Uh, and I'm always wearing a wire t-shirt. <laughs> it's good, good. Excellent. I know your time is precious today. And please do connect with our friend here. So, so you asked on your wish list of three people, one of those people was Simon. What's your question for him? Um, the, my question would be more to do with the actual Wira program. Um, at the would you, should I get? Okay. Um, at the moment, I'm uh, currently finishing my. I'm in my going into my third year at university. Um, so I just want to know what what key things do you look for in startups to join Wira. Okay. Brilliant question. So the key things we're looking for: are talent. Okay. So uh, Gonzalo Martin Villa, who's the global CEO of uh, Wire, is here as well. And he has a beautiful expression about what we're looking for, talent. So what he's talking about there is we invest in people more than we do ideas. Much easier to help a person than it is to help an idea, which I think is a, a nice way of describing it. So what do we mean by talent? From my point of view, personally, subjectively, it's really easy. A demonstrable, proven track record of achievement People who just achieve, 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 whether it's in your personal life or in your professional life or in whatever it is you're doing, there is a common characteristic in the entrepreneurs who do best, and it's that they have consistently done so, and it's not just a sudden surprise. Mm. So um, whatever it is you're doing, be able to articulate how successful you've been in doing it. And that's what we're really looking for. So we're looking for, and, and for Wire specifically, it's not telco, it's not mobile, it's digital. We're looking for relevancy, ideally, because what we're trying to do is find things that we can add value to. So if we can see that you're determined, you've got a clear goal, you're able to articulate it, you've surrounded yourself by other brilliant people, that you're on a track that's going to secure investment, and what you want is acceleration. There's a big difference between acceleration and incubation. In Spanish, and obviously Telefonica is a Spanish company, incubation literally translated is sort of to do with sick. We're not looking for sick businesses. We're looking for really healthy ones. Mm. So what we want is due to evidence that you're progressing. Yeah? Does that, work? Does that help? Thank you very much. Simon Devonshire, at Simon Devonshire on the Twitter. Uh, thank you very much. Now, I'm very conscious that I said um, I asked for uh, some, some dream meetings. We've uh, made a couple of those uh, match up already, and I promised you I'd ask for you, sir. Mark, who's yeah. on your hit list? Oh, get some Is that on? on? Yes. Yep. Um, two, sorry. Oh, here we go. If you just come up a bit, here we All go. Right. Um, two, two projects I work on. One is um, I'd like to meet Brian Souter. Yes. Uh, from Stagecoach? Stagecoach, right. okay. Or Boris Johnson. Okay. Because for uh, six years intensively, but probably 20 years, uh, I and more recently a whole group of engineers, architects, have been working on a new railway around London, okay. which goes alongside the M25, connects all the railways crossing the M25 with each other, yes. and the airports, of course. Wow. Much more sensible than a new airport. Yes in the estuary, which will never happen. Okay, so, so Brian Much and Boris. Much more sensible than expanding, yeah. expanding Heathrow. Yeah. Just joining all the airports we've got, 
with all the railways. Yes, I see. Okay. I see. And I get, I get, I get, I get the idea. And you want to meet Boris and Brian? Anyone else? Brian Souter owns Southwest Trains, yes. which would benefit greatly. All the train companies would benefit. Yes. Boris would benefit by having a big idea because Boris Island will never get built. Right. Okay. So and I'm just going to I'm going to put Heathrow. you on the spot very quickly. Your your efforts to date to connect directly with Brian Souter. Um, through Southwest Trains, but haven't got anywhere. We've been through, poli I've, I've spoken to ministers, yep. civil servants, BA, BAA, and all you, the big companies. So you never get anywhere with them because right. they don't want it. Exactly, exactly. And they've got their business plans, it seems, and they don't want to deviate. Oh, our business plans were not based on your railway, which looks like a monorail, which it isn't quite because the technology yeah, is not yeah, right. Yeah. So they, they, they can't cope. No. Well, these are these are these are two very interesting characters. So I want to I want to think a bit Can more I just about say those. The, the second one. <laughs> you mean the, the third one? No, the second. Boris. No, no, the second business. Ah. The, an ailing mobile phone company chief executive, or a um, fibre broadband provider. They're only two BT or Virgin. Yeah. So Virgin might come into both of them actually. Yes. Because actors, singers. Sportsmen at a play perform at a very high level in this country, and only the very top get paid well. Right. The rest of them don't get paid, and yet you go to little venues all over and you see them doing brilliantly. Yes. I want to earn money for them via the internet through live streaming. I see. For two years, I've been working with one other man. Yep. We developed our own systems our own technology for live streaming at a very low cost. Got We've it. got to the stage now so somebody where we need yeah. investment. Okay, so somebody at one of those phone companies. Good, we've got it. What's your first name again? Michael Buckley. Michael, oh, Michael. thank you, Michael. Michael. Sorry. Michael, thank you very much. Michael, thank you very much. So, of course it's important uh, that Michael has been in touch directly uh, with Southwest Trains and with Brian. Uh, I put it to you, not to you, Michael, but to everyone else, that there are people on your hit list, and if you're honest, I think you'll admit this, that you have not been, to date, sufficiently serious about connecting with. So my challenge to you this afternoon is get obsessed with the people that you want to connect with. Find out everything about them and write to them. With my first business, I was absolutely desperate to connect with the man who founded and ran the second largest dating company in the world. Uh, not because I wanted to join it. Uh, I think I'd have been uh, rejected from that. Uh, he was based in Derby, uh, and he had 13 million members on his website. And I was fascinated by his technology. And I wrote to him again and again, and I heard absolutely nothing back from him. And I called his office again and again and again, and I failed to get through. And I actually got quite a friendly relationship going uh, with his secretary at the time. Uh, he was uh, laughing at me and saying, you're so persistent, aren't you? <laughs> I said, yes, I am. And I'm not going to give up. And we had a nice few chats. And anyway, I'm going to cut a very long story short because I forget the exact number. But bear with me when I say that his phone number ended with 111. And one afternoon, I was so exasperated, I changed the number to 112 just because that was a sort of creative flash of brilliance that I, <laughs> the, only, the only thing I was capable of, I was so frustrated. And I put 112 in. And the phone was answered straight away by a guy called Martin, who was his COO. And I said, hi, Martin, it's, uh, my name's Ollie. I've been trying to get in touch with Mel. And Martin laughed at me on the phone and he said, yeah, haven't we all? And I said, I guess he's a busy guy. He goes, he's a really busy guy. Who are you and what are you doing? And I told him what I was doing. And he said, listen, I'm in London next week. Let's have a coffee. And we had that coffee. And it led to an incredibly lucrative retainer for our little business. And he even offered uh, to give us a little office of our own. So that was the second time uh, that had happened. But just through that little twist to get through to someone. And so I don't know who it is on Brian's team that we'd need to butter up. I'll give you an example. Sinead Cahill in City Hall looks after business relations. S-I-N-E-A-D. C-A-H-I-L-L, -L. and she is a very, very good gatekeeper to someone like Boris, or indeed the Deputy Mayor Kit Malthouse for business and enterprise, who might be a more likely target in the short term because Boris gets inundated. So what I thought I'd do is I want to answer any question in our final sort of 20 minutes, and it could be hideously practical about networking events. 
It could be about connecting with team members or investors or customers. It could be anything that occurs to you. But before I do, I just wanted to run down and not all of these, I mean, none of these actually are set in stone. They're just my views of what I wish someone had told me 10 years ago before I'd built up relationships with hundreds and now thousands of people who have helped me immeasurably. And they're just my very, very brief conclusions, uh, which I thought I'd share. The first, and it comes back to a point made earlier, which I absolutely get where you're coming from, which is if you feel that the conversation, you have nothing to offer each other, then it's time to move on. And I just say, well, just beware. Because my number one thing I've learned, which I just thought I'd test on you, is to be open. Uh, be open to every conversation you ever have for the ability of a person to spark an idea. Because if a person likes you, you stand on the threshold of everyone they know. And if you like them, then unwittingly, they've stepped onto the threshold of everyone you know. And so you'll go to an event and you'll say, who are you and what do you do? And the person looking at you will say, I'm a pig farmer from Norfolk. And your heart will sink. And my point is, don't let your heart sink when you meet the pig farmer from Norfolk. Because my experience has shown that the pig farmer is often a very nice person. They're often quite a good laugh. They often live next to weird and wonderful people. They're often related to weird and wonderful people. And often those relationships which they can unlock for you have not been codified anywhere. The fact that this guy lives next to the chief exec of Coca-Cola does not appear on LinkedIn. The fact that my sister-in-law runs Virgin does not appear on Twitter. But if we get on, I'll reveal that to you. So be open in your attitude. And I'm sure you are already. You wouldn't have turned up to an event like this if you weren't. But be even more open. The second thing, and it's slightly obvious, is your energy. Have a positive energy and an enthusiasm. And for me, that is the essence of networking. Because you're helping people all the time. And have that energy. The third thing, continue to be persistent and go into your sent items every week and go, which buggers haven't come back to me? And send that email again. Be persistent and I bet you they come back in time. Be curious. It's so easy to get people on the back foot and you'll suddenly get into the role and you're being asked questions, questions, questions. The most successful people I've ever met ask brilliant questions. So become known for asking, I don't mean clever Trevor questions that catch people out, I just mean questions that show a real genuine hunger and an interest for the person. So be curious. The fifth one, and I bet this is in common with so many people sitting here, be cheeky, be audacious. I chatted with someone earlier, and as we met very briefly, he got me before I even had a chance, he goes, before you get rid of me, because he knew what was happening in the exercise, he said, before you say goodbye, he said, I've already emailed you while this session was going on. That's cheeky. It's not rude, but it is a bit cheeky, okay? Ronan Dunn runs O2. He's in the building. He's also on Twitter. If you at him and say it would be great to cross paths if you have five minutes, that is cheeky. And it's quite audacious. I bet you can guess his email address too if you're feeling really cheeky. So be cheeky and be audacious and experiment and you just don't know. If that means hanging around outside the VIP room or the speaker lounge, that's cool too. And Martha Lane Vox will say the same and Brent Hoberman will say the same and all of these people will say that's how they met the people that changed their lives and businesses. So be cheeky. The sixth one is timing. I'm gonna come back to it. Timing is everything. Ask yourself again and again and again, why are you connecting with this person at this moment in their life? And if you can come up with a good reason, you're off to a winner. Because I say, exactly right, good timing. Yes, I'm going to 02 later and I'll see you there. I mean, I'm on rung one, right? I'm talking about people on rung 100, yeah? Yes, I'm going to see my friend Ben Saunders, who's off to the South Pole, whose sponsor happens to be Intel. And given you don't compete with him, I wonder if he would introduce you to Intel. I don't know. We'll just ask. So timing and cheekiness. The seventh one, the seventh uh, habit, if I dare use that word, of successful networking is helpfulness. Be outrageously helpful, and it often doesn't cost any money. Every time I read an interesting article, either online or in a newspaper, I try and make it a resolution to share it with at least one or two people. And all I tend to title the email is, thought of you. 
So shopping comparison, thought of you. Bikes and recycling, I thought of you. Richard Branson or Brian Souter, he's just come up with another outrageous suggestion. I thought of you, yeah? Lovely, light, helpful ways to keep in touch. Because, why am I saying this? Not for the good of your health, but because by being helpful, you become very, very attractive to helpfulness from other people. And provided you can team your helpfulness with sharing what you're up to, you can attract spot-on opportunities. Yeah? I shared an idea last night on Facebook called, my little made-up name, CareBnB. Like Airbnb, but for looking after people. So, if you wanted to give someone a home for a week, you'd give them a home for a week at a really tough time in their life. And I wrote straight away to the founder of Airbnb about it. Because I met him five years ago in San Francisco. Has he got back to me? Has he bugger? Of he hasn't. But he will. He will come back. Because I'll write to him again. But on my Facebook, I've got some helpful suggestions about where we could take that. Okay? But if I didn't share it, I wouldn't get those helpful suggestions. Next one. Hospitality, hosting. I've hosted hundreds of events over the years. Have I ever paid a bean to hire a room? No. Because for me, some beers at the old dog and duck, and I'm a bit stingy, so you might have to buy your own beer, is the start of an amazing evening. Even if it's 10 people that turn up, doesn't bother me, that's great. That's 10 more people than it would have been if it was just the two of us. That's amazing. So be hospitable and host stuff. Very cheap and really, really effective. Two final ones. Make connections, make introductions. Think about it and explain how you know the people you're introducing. And if you're introducing one person to someone who's massively busier than the other person, I've learned to tear it up in advance. To say, Annie, I know you're busy. I've got someone I really think is worth 10 minutes of your time. Would you be interested in meeting him? Make introductions, because the most powerful things that will happen to change your business, I promise you, will be people introducing you to other people. So if you can get a habit and known as an introducer, that will pay dividend. When you're trying to get in touch with incredibly busy people, here are the quick things I learned. And I stole them all off a guy called Dale Carnegie in How to Win Friends and Influence People. Not a book to read on the tube, by the way. It looks odd, okay? <laughs> of the 50 shades of the business world. Uh, <laughs> cover that up. And what he gives as tips, and they all work, by the way, is offer to go and see someone. Offer to go and see someone. It's a really powerful gesture. Not, would you have time to meet up? Can I come and see you? I know that Wire is based just near Good Street. I will come and see you, OK? Make yourself completely amenable and flexible to them at any time. And make it sound as if, and you're not fibbing initially, make it sound as if you only want a very, very, very small amount of their time. 10 minutes. Can I come and see you for 10 minutes? OK? If they knock you back for a meeting, how about a phone call? And if you don't think you're going to get either, can I ask you some really quick questions over email? And let me tell you, if you frame that right to the successful business people on your hit list, and they say no to can I ask you a few quick questions on email, I think, don't you, they're being a bit stingy. I think people are going to say yes to that. And I think you can build up. Someone asked to come see me for five minutes the other day. I said, yes. Who's ever had a meeting for five minutes? <laughs> it's not five minutes, is it? We ended up meeting for an hour. He was amazing. Yeah. So you can get in someone's diary in the same way. It really, really, really works. My final one is just on sharing. Share your absolute. And I'm not talking about your special source secret now. I'm talking about your dreams for your business. Share them with people particularly if they're cheeky and audacious, share them. Share them on Twitter, share them on LinkedIn, but share them with the people in your life, especially the people you like but you haven't seen for a while. Because the people you like and you haven't seen for a while are the most likely people to change your business. Okay? And all the research has proved that. Because the people we know really well, there's a guy called Mark Granovetta at Stanford University who did a survey and some big research on this, proved that of course the majority of new opportunities come through people, they also come through the people we don't know very well. Because the people we know really well tend to know the same things and the same people that we know. So, I found out at the end of last week that I have to find a new office because my team is growing. Well, I could write to my best buddies. No, that's not how I'm going to find my new office. 
I will find my new office by writing to someone I like, but I haven't seen for a while, I can guarantee. Yep. So that's what I challenge you to do. Reconnect and share some of those hooks that will encourage someone to come back to you. So those are some of the things that I wish I'd known. Now, I think we've got just under 10 minutes for quick, well, any questions, basically. And it could be ridiculously anything. We're going to go one and two and three for a start. Thank you, Ben, uh, for rushing around. Yes, sir. OK, so you said you've got thousands of connections. How do you manage all those connections? And how do you know who to connect to and when to connect to and that kind of mm. stuff? Yeah, so, 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 the th so, so uh, how do I manage them? Uh, I use th th things like LinkedIn, but I also use uh, Google products like uh, on, my, on my sort of Google contacts, and I will often hashtag people within a contact. So hashtag Brazil, for example. So it helps me find people really, really quickly. I also draw out, sounds a bit geeky, because I am on that, uh, I draw out little maps of people all the time. So I actively map people physically. Also, LinkedIn Labs has got a really powerful app which can visualize your network. So it'll look like a Milky Way, and you can see big planets within that who are hyper connectors within your circle. And you'll find, because you've got 400, look at Steve Moore, who you met earlier. He's like Mars on Mars my LinkedIn map, and it reminds me that actually time with Steve is never wasted. He's great fun, and he knows so many mutual contacts. Yeah, So map and use LinkedIn Labs uh, to map your network um, like that. So that's one of the ways I manage it. But on a regular basis, I'll actively go through with one of my team and say, I'd love to catch up with Ben for a coffee. I'd love to ask him how he's getting on. So, so there are a couple of tools that I, I use there. Yeah. Uh, you, one of the questions earlier you asked was, um, th there are so many networking events on there, how, out there. How do you select the best one? Um, and do you find they actually put you in front of uh, potential customers? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I am really strict about um, personally about and, and so should everyone be about events you do go to. But that doesn't mean um, um, you know you don't experiment from time to time. So uh, I won't go to business events on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays as it happens. And I always have, uh, as, as I'm sure you all do, uh, a night which is reserved for uh, for family uh, every, every week. And that means when I do go out, I will often go to two or three in one night. Uh, personally, I find events which have involved some sort of filtering, uh, and that sounds a bit uh, crass and uh, elitist, but some sort of filtering tend to uh, be really worthwhile. What, what an example. The Smarter 100. Okay, So Smarter run a 100 list, uh, which is coming up in November. Uh, Business Zone is a, is a company, a website that has some great events. Uh, for example, The Pitch, which is happening in Bristol later this month. And why do they tend to be good? Because thousands or hundreds and hundreds have applied, and only a certain number have made the list. Also, loads of the people I've met, when I've asked them, how did you meet your investor? It's been at one of these awards style events. So I tend to pick those off quite carefully. And even if your name's not down, very often, cheekily, you can get on the guest list. Yeah, so you can look who's tweeting about it. And that person who's only got, whatever, 100 followers is actually incredibly important because Louise is the organizer. And just by writing to Louise nicely, you can get into that event. So I was saying, look, look for those events and really look beforehand to see who's going. And the old one, I'm sure half the audience do this already. If you're going to an event with speakers, use Google Images to see what they look like beforehand. And this sounds even creepier, doesn't it? But go and make a beeline for them before they speak. They'll be quite flattered, but try and get out of their face quite quickly because they've got to prepare. Fine. But that means that after they've spoken, they'll have a huge line of people and you've already got in there. Yeah? So Google Images all the time. Have a little hit list. It's like MI6 when you go in there. Have a little briefing pack. And one of your team will help you do that. Got one more. OK, so we've got a yes, uh, just here. Hi, what's your policy on business cards? Yes, so, so, so just, just expand the question a little bit. Okay, so do you think in every network event you should use them? And what, like how much information do you think that should be on them? And how often do you give, away, give them away? Yeah, so, so I would try, I mean, I, I, I'm, at a, I'm at a stage in my life where I want to be as accessible as possible. Uh, and often at business events, and I'll often go to an event with students, uh, and I will say, um, if you want to write to me, it's really easy. I'm just Ollie at ollibarrett.com. Well, that's 50%. It's like the Grand National. 50% brr, gone. They never bother. Uh, so you'd make it a tiny bit uh, difficult in that sense, but you want to make it easy for people to connect with you. So my number one question is, should you only have one business card? Okay? And my thought is, 
consider having a personal card. Okay? Because I've been fortunate enough to play a role in a number of organizations, and they change. My involvement with them changes. Some of them hopefully live on, and some of them don't. So I would strongly encourage you to go to moo.com or goodprint.co.uk and for a tenner, get yourself 100 personal business cards and carry them around. I've got some uh, here, which is just my name at myname.com or whatever it is. It could be Gmail. I was handed a card the other day, uh, fandabidozy at hotmail.com. It was, it was not a good look, you see, uh, at these business events. So I'd say have some personal cards, particularly if you're just in the early stages of your business, which will allow you to keep in touch because it's the personal connection, and I would encourage that to have Twitter on it perhaps, your mobile if you feel uh, comfortable. The one good reason for getting some personal cards done, and indeed any business card done, is because it's much easier, in my opinion, to get a business card off your target if you've got a card because that physical offering of it will often trigger up their card. I met the guy, incredibly senior, and he's in the building today, who runs Telefonica globally, and it was only through getting my card out that he got not one but two of his, because he too had two separate cards, one for Wira and one for Telefonica, because he's so passionate about Wira. So just have a think about that. I wish we had uh, longer. Thank you uh, very, very much indeed for your time. I think that um, the absolute number one thing, alongside reading a book which changes your life, is meeting somebody in business who changes your life. So if you've taken a single thing from today, I'll be absolutely uh, delighted. I'd love uh, to keep in touch. I'd love you to share this because my passion in life is making useful connections. I'd love to talk to you afterwards. And I'm very, very grateful uh, to Wira and Campus Party for giving me this opportunity.